my value is not inherently connected to what I do. My value is inherently connected to how I show up for myself in the world. And that generates motion in a direction that I really desire instead of in a direction that was set for me in this screen in my mind and that I convinced myself that I had to go that way even though I don't want to. What happens in between is all about the awkward middle phase of creation. You know, after you've taken your first steps, but before you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Join me, Athena, as I learn from artists, creators, and entrepreneurs about the tactical and emotional methods they use after the initial excitement of following your dreams meets the reality of following your dreams. Hi, lovely listener. Today, I am joined by the... Luminous, Juliana Luna, who is a yogi and multidisciplinary artist from Brazil. As founder of the Aluna Practice, Juliana teaches people how to use ancestry and lunar knowledge to cultivate self awareness and well being. Hi. Hi. <laughs> how are you, Athena? I'm well. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So I want to jump right in. When did you first notice the moon? I'd love to hear like your first moon story. My first moon story was definitely, I mean, it's in my name, right? So my first Mm -hmm. moon story was really looking at my name and kind of understanding this connection of, you know, it takes me right back into being a diasporic presence, right? I was born in Brazil. My ancestors that came from the Yoruba land in Nigeria traveled through the Atlantic, ended up in a foreign land. And when they arrived in that land, they were stripped out of their names, right? And their names is what actually connected back all of their identity to their family, to their traditions, to their cultural understanding of connection and family and community. And so when I look at that and I look at my name today with the influence of what that brokenness has created in my experience as a Black Brazilian woman born in this land, which is a land of so much richness, so much, I would say, connection to nature, right? Brazil is one of those points on planet Earth that hold most of the vegetation of the Amazonian forest. And it's a very, very incredible ecosystem for nature and for the balance of everything that's alive, you know, in this world. So I looked at my name and I said to myself, wow, what is it that connects me to that notion of one, the spirituality, the umbilical cord that connects me back to my ancestry? And then what is it that also evokes through my name, this connection to the land and connection to nature and the balance between everything that exists? And I found out that Luna... (laughs) One of my maternal names is that bridge. And Luna in Latin means moon. And so when you kind of understand your mission through your recognition of your name, it's when things start to shift in your life and start to kind of follow a certain pattern. And so I started to pay attention. I started to pay attention and what that is and how did that influence me and then I realized that it was totally under my nose the whole time so the moon is that reminder for me it's like you are blessed by knowing your ancestry you are blessed by knowing what you are here to do in the world and just have courage you know (laughs) yeah 
Yeah, that's very beautiful. Yeah, names are very powerful. And I've have, well, I have a great relationship to my many, many names that I was given. (laughs) But it's always so interesting to see how people interact with the meaning behind their name and what meaning they ascribe like individually to their name. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Can you speak a bit about the Aluna practice? So what do you mean by lunar mapping? And how did you first come to this practice? Or I mean, develop like your specific framework? Okay. So lunar mapping is a technology that has been used by our ancestors for thousands of thousands of years. Unfortunately, you know, with with the severance of our connection to that wisdom and with, you know, the toll that religion has imposed in our cultural understanding of ancestral wisdom. Unfortunately, with, with religion being one of the mood killers for us, we haven't been able to practice any of those ancestral practices that are ours by birthright. And so when I started looking into my name and finding out that there's a different way of being, a different way of relating, there's a different way of creating movement in life that is not based in solar time. And what solar time is, is just this agenda, right? It's a constant interruption of our cyclical nature, right? Our cyclical nature is about giving us the time and space to express ourselves emotionally and to dig into the very fabric that sustains us as humans in the world, which is constantly changing, right? It's, we are beings that are constantly transforming. And for some reason, we are set in the idea that we are settled. We are settled in this rigidness. And if, you know, if we kind of like start to wiggle a little bit, we will understand that that rigidness, it's been actually imposed into us. So what is a Luna practice? A Luna practice is that wiggling, is that practice of making space within that rigidness. So we can come back into a state that is much more aligned with who we are at the core of us because our cyclical nature is craving for that movement, for that highly adapting expression. And we haven't been able to exercise that to our fullest. So this is what a Luna practice is, is a shift of perspective from that solar time that has kept us in that rigid state to loony solar time, which is a framework of understanding time space from a cyclical perspective. And that gives us an understanding of seasons and ease and action and light and dark shadows and brilliance. They start to have a different meaning for us. They start to kind of bring a different flavor to our lives, a flavor of completion, of unity, a flavor where wholeness is experienced through the very daily tasks that we kind of operate. So yeah, that's what a Luna practice is. It's a way of making space for our true whole unity to come to the surface. Mm -hmm. You mentioned like the cyclical nature of the moon. And when you look to nature in general, it's always seasonal. It's always also repeating. It's always, you know, it's a cycle, but the seasons are temporary and in motion constantly. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think what has been interesting about solar time, as you're putting it, capitalism also. (laughs) Yeah. it's, It's embedded into solar time. Yeah. Is that It too is always moving, but it's asking us to be linear. It's asking us to 
arrive at one spot directly in front of where you just were rather than that yeah. kind of like loop and forward loop and forward and then yeah. bigger loop all the way back to the first loop you know yeah so i think that that is so interesting because i think it's easy to go well it's solar versus lunar mm-hmm. it's easy to make them in opposition but i have found it easier to kind of reconcile them when i look for their similarities and look to see how oh well it is rigid but maybe they're both connected in the motion of it though one has a more <laughs> violent connotation but going back to cycles you wrote somewhere or said somewhere in an article that what really fascinates you about cycles is the kind of like being continuously pulled into whatever programming like has been set and yeah. what you just mentioned with like we realize that solar time right now has been imposed or at least the dominance of solar time has been imposed on us and I think it's really beautiful to think about okay we're still resetting ourselves into programming but to be intentional about that programming is perhaps what is setting the Aluna practice apart from what is currently in dominant culture yeah And I would love to hear about kind of what it felt like when you were initially moving and leaning into this practice, what it felt like to trust into, you know, the cycles when you were like initially starting. This is such a good question. It felt very foreign and it felt scary because I just knew that I felt crazy. Like that was my definition of myself. I feel crazy. (laughs) Meaning I had so many things coming up, so many emotional, just outbursts sometimes. Like I would be highly emotional and then I'll be like super shut off. And then I would go from like feeling enraged to like wanting to just cuddle and feel protected you know I would have so many mood swings and it felt a little bit almost like as if I knew that there was something else that I could do to regulate myself but I just didn't know how Mm -hmm. so in the beginning to trust these framework it was a challenge because I had to rewire my whole way of looking at myself so it's almost like as if I'm redesigning neural pathways to help me understand that one, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> you know, like that is the basic thing that Aluna kind of teaches you. It's like, you don't have to do anything. If you feel like doing it, that's one thing. If you are putting it off for a specific reason, that's another thing. And so how do we find a middle ground? How do we bridge those two things, right? Or like, how can I allow myself to feel so comfortable in my body that I'm able to do the things that are meant to be done in a way that doesn't overwhelm me, in a way that doesn't take away my inner peace, my joy, my comfort within myself, or even my sense of safety, right? All of those things are very much embedded into how we create in this culture. It's like, if you're not doing anything, then you're like, you're useless, right? Like if you're not Mm -hmm. doing anything, you're not of value. Yeah. So that's the first thing that Aluna kind of helped me shift around. I'm like, my value is not inherently connected to what I do. My value is inherently connected to how I show up for myself in the world. And that generates motion in a direction that I really desire instead of in a direction that was set for me in this screen in my mind and that I convinced myself that I had to go that way even though I don't want to (laughs) yeah so that's why you know like I don't have to go in that direction what I normally like guide people through in the Luna is 
come back to your emotional body understand what your emotional body is giving like what are the offerings that, that your emotional body is presenting and then once you understand what those are you start to kind of like dig deeper within those offerings and you find the golden nuggets there at all times you're like oh this is what was causing me to feel so uneasy it's because I needed a walk outside for five ten minutes you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is what is making me feel frustrated I haven't really eaten something that is delicious and it nourishes my soul today there are these little things that we can do for ourselves that are very much connecting us back to that sense of safety and this is all what lunar work is lunar work is to connect us back to our sense of safety is to make space within our nervous system so we can feel as if we're like supported and safe in the journey of dealing with those emotional ups and downs so I don't know if it answers your question yeah yeah but it's a long-winded answer for the Luna is this big <laughs> umbrella of space holding that you can do for yourself and then that will determine how you show up in the world mm -hmm. yeah beautifully put so the theme of this season is community, and I was really excited to talk to you about community because I'm thinking of it from a different angle than with some of my other guests. So I'm really fascinated with ancestral work right now. I've been like digging deep into ancestral work and brief context, I felt very isolated for like the majority of 2021. and. It wasn't until I started doing ancestral work that I started to feel like I had a community <laughs> that like understood what was going on. Because similar to what you were saying, where you're like, I'm doing something and I know that it's right, but I feel crazy about it crazy. because mm -hmm. everything around me and people around me are just like not doing that. Yeah. And so I have found it like I'm deeply shocked about this, but I have found it so interesting the way that being in community with my ancestors has like filled for the time being uh, this like void of like, I'm alone. I'm the only one doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what has been your relationship to being in community with ancestors? And also let's throw in the moon too. <laughs> You know, like being in community with the moon, what does that look like? I love this question so much. It's so rich. Being in community with the moon is ancestral work. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, the moon has a connection to our most ancestral patterns. It goes back into our sense of safety of, you know, like that primordial need of feeling safe. Mm -hmm. And that is the connection to our mother. The moon is that representative cosmically of the mother, right? Waters, emotions, that yin energy in yoga. It's the deep unknown that nurtures everything within it. So if we think about ancestral work, we're thinking about the womb. We're thinking about that vessel that held us and made us into who we are today. And when we were bathing in those juices of, you know, cooking mm -hmm. <laughs> while we're in, in our mother's womb, we received all the different inputs from our ancestral algorithms that are genetically embedded into our mother's cooking juices. <laughs> So all of that data, all of that information, right, started to influence in how we are shaped in that very womb. And then when we come out of it, there's the other thread that connects more of that ancestral information, which is the cultural aspect of who we are. So we have the genetic aspect that has 
created, you know, a very unique makeup that has the presence of the ones that came before us into that makeup. It's embedded into that. And when we come into the world, then we have the cultural layer, which is how did our mothers, our parents, the people who raised us received information from the ones that came before them? What are the social dynamics that are influencing into what that information is and how that information travels, right? So we, from age zero to age seven, we start to soak in all of this like sponges. And we don't really understand it in a cognitive manner because cognitively, you know, we are it, the experience itself. But the ancestral information is just at all times informing who we are. And then when we move on into our, you know, young lives and adult lives and so on, we are deeply shaped by what that information was from that age, from zero to seven. It's like there was a carving in a piece of wood that created personality and colors and, and identities, right? And so when we work with the moon, we're actually referring back to that sense of safety every single time. We are referring back into that womb aspect of our experience because we are connecting to that sense of safety from a very deep level. Our emotions are the, the tips, the cues that are kind of like pointing us in the directions that we can go in order to connect back to that safety. So you see, when we are doing lunar work, we're doing ancestral work. We are rewiring the patterns of ancestral imbalances that might have come throughout those algorithms that were programmed in that genetic structure that we don't even know what they are. But like sometimes some aunt that never saw you like after 10 years shows up and you're like, auntie, how are you? Oh my God, you look just like such and such your great uncle or your grandfather or your grandmother, you know, the gestures, the way we speak, the way we move our eyes sometimes like evokes presences of people that are not even here anymore. And I have a really good story to actually tell you if we have enough time about that. My great grandmother is very present in my life and I've never met her. She passed before I was born, but she was a healer. And because she was a healer, there was a big line outside her door and she just healed people left and right every day that she was off from work because she worked as a maid for a minister for her whole life. And for some reason, this woman was very prosperous. She was able to buy land, settle most of her family into those plots of land that she bought. And she had all these pieces of jewelry like made of pure gold that she would just buy and store. And she would wear them. She was very like vain and beautiful. And so she left a treasure box in a, to the care of one of my aunts, but no one knew this. My aunt is the only one who knew. So fast forward to 2022, 70 years later, my aunt calls me and says, hey, I have something to share with you. Would you come over? I said, of course I would come over. So I went to her house and she said, your great grandmother left something for you. And I'm like, what? I've never met my great grandmother. How did she leave me something? And she said, well, she said that I should give this pieces of her story to the ones that had her outlook in life, the ones that treated others with kindness, the ones that were deeply invested into courageously showing up for themselves in the world. And you have proven yourself to be that. So here's the first piece of jewelry that I'm giving to all of the grandchildren, the first one to receive a solid gold ring that your great grandmother left you. And I was like blown away by that. I'm like, what? How is this possible? Like this ring traveled time and space to get to my hand, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And so it just shows how lunar work has really, really, I would say, opened me to time travel in that way. That nonlinearity that you mentioned is, is that time traveling experience where past, present, and future start to become almost like a moving, transforming, and ever-changing force. Yeah, that's really awesome. Thank you for sharing that story. (laughs) Safety is what's coming up for me next. So I'm on your email list. So I got the inside scoop (laughs) that you have found love. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Congratulations. Claps for you. you. (laughs) One of the things that you mentioned is that somewhere in my research, you mentioned is the way that opening yourself up to and giving yourself softness, compassion, trusting in wholeness, like I want to call them modalities, but I don't know if that's what they are. These aspects, these gifts really (laughs) that people can give themselves are really powerful. (laughs) And I think also sometimes can feel very far away, especially I will speak as a Black Jamaican-American woman. It's hard to interact with softness and like let it into my space. And I think a huge part of that is safety. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned that the moon is that representative of safety, while also being this sort of like water mover, bender really, it's the master water bender, And this like soft energy, it really makes me wonder, like, I don't even really know how to verbalize it. It's all like physical, which is why I'm like, it would take me like 30 minutes to try and translate it from physical to verbal. Okay. But that's exactly what the moon work is about. It's Mm -hmm. about feeling it in our bodies. So you are right on theme (laughs) (laughs) with this conversation. It's about this. Absolutely. Understanding that safety is located in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm. And coming back to the body is what regulates the experience. So moving the end, when you say water bender, when you say that, you know, master water bender is that understanding of letting whatever it is that needs to be here to be here. And once that is settled, accepted, that can move through and it can express itself in whatever way it desires. And being able to translate that is where that mastery comes handy Mm. to say, okay, this is where my lack of safety takes me. I can feel it right here in my body. I can feel it right there in my body. I I can feel a pressure in my head. I can feel my throat closing in you know, my voice starts to tremble. All of those things are connected to that sense of safety. So, Hmm. well, I'm glad you received the question. (laughs) (laughs) What has offering yourself softness and compassion, what has that shifted in your ability to be in partnership be in relationship and not just romantically speaking, but like how has that shift in relationship with yourself or at least how you're treating yourself, how has that translated into your relationships with everyone else? Oh, softness has created a lot of room within my nervous system. It has created a space for breath and I used to be on the edge all the time. And that softness has brought a sense of, I can breathe, you know, I can take my time. I can be sad. And I can also experience pleasure. I can allow myself to be more gentle. It's that breath feeling. It's really that breath feeling, that expansion and contraction that just, is allowed whatever that is in that moment so yeah they're offering softness to myself has 
helped me make space for softness from other sources to be reflected back to me. Like my partner is incredibly soft with me. It's like, wow, I'm so happy that you're mirroring this back because for a long time, it was the opposite. I was so hard on myself most of the time that a lot of my relationships mirrored that back to me. And so I'm finally saying, ooh, yes, that softness that I've been practicing is now finally ready to be reflected back to me from other sources. A great example of this is, for example, the other day I was rushing and I had a live programmed and everything was already in place and, you know, my team was on it and I was on it and I got to this Airbnb. I came to surprise my boyfriend for his, um, he performed at a big concert. He was one of the headliners of this big festival. And I came to surprise him. He didn't know I came to see him from New York and he's in Brazil. So it was this crazy emotional day and, you know, I'm exhausted because I was so exhilarated on the plane and overnight flight, so I couldn't really sleep. So by the time we got to the apartment, when we finally like said, okay, now we can chill a little bit, the lights went off. The entire neighborhood had no electricity. And then I was like, oh, maybe it's going to be a 10 minute thing. And so 10 minutes go by, 30 minutes go by, 40 minutes go by. And then I started getting super nervous. I'm like, whoa, I have a whole thing programmed. What am I going to do? And my sense of responsibility like is on when this kind of stuff happens, right? I'm like, what am I going to do? <laughs> and I start stressing. And he looks at me and he said, hey, I'm here. I got you. What do we need? Can we call a friend? Can we go over a friend's home to do this and use the internet there? I said, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. So he calls one of his friends that lives close by. And he calls an Uber. He's like, okay, let's go to my friend's house. And then we're moving. And as we're moving, he's holding me in that softness. And I'm like frazzled and thinking, ah. And also because I hadn't slept and all of that stuff, it's just like added layers of, you know, instability within my nervous system but then he just was so soft that when I looked at him I melted back into like oh of course it's not meant to be this hard you know it's ease it's we have a solution we have created a bridge that can take us into what we need to do without freaking out it was so nice it felt so nice it felt affirming to receive that softness back. And it just shows that it is possible to inhabit a softer experience if we allow ourselves to do so. Mm. Cacao. Now it's time for the seedling round where short questions lead to tasty answers. What's your favorite moon phase and why? Or which one is speaking to you most right now? The one that's speaking to me the most right now is my in-between, like the crescent aspect when I'm moving from darkness into the light because I'm in a transition period and I feel I'm still not able to see clearly what's coming ahead of me and that it's a little bit anxiety inducing, but also it's prompting me to trust more deeper to trust deeper so I would say the crescent moon phase is where I feel the most comfortable right now mm. or I would say uncomfortable <laughs> right <laughs> fill in the blank healing is healing is making space for ease mm. love that what does reciprocity feel like to you Ah. <laughs> feels like that it feels juicy and I can finally rest into the notion of being held as I'm holding someone mm-hmm. mm, sounds yummy <laughs> yeah <laughs> it is cacao that ends the seedling round. 
I love to end on the question of the week. <laughs> What's the question of the week? For me? Mm-hmm. Whether to continue or not, that's the question of the week for me. Mm. To continue to nurture this work as my primary focus, or if I should shift into something else and keep this work as a priority that's like not in the first plane. Yeah. Yep. That's the question of the week for me. Mm-hmm. That was my question of the week several weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Juliana, for such thoughtful and nourishing responses. Where can people connect with you? People can come through my social media practice, Aluna, or you can also come through my website, alunamethod.com. You can hit me up on my personal page, Juliana Luna. I'm going to be teaching some classes at a couple of different places, like this place called Sea Grape Apothecary. They're based in Utah. And I also have always workshops and journeys with the Luna practice. You can subscribe. And also the Breath Circle offerings that are monthly. And those are free, so you can join and just be part of the community. So yeah, come through. Just hit me up if you have any questions and if you would like to work with me, I am here. Lovely. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for listening. As always, I appreciate your ears and I will catch you in the next season.